um, first of all, it has to be the worst participatory experience to be the speaker that's between you and a glass of wine. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to get through this so we can all sort of have a big conversation about everything that sort of has happened during the day. Do I sound okay? Oh, weird. Um, I'm also going to be handing out, um, because it is the end of the day, and you're probably all tired of taking notes, um, I actually have two things to share, and we, we're in the process of making more. One is called an Elastic Manifesto for Museums and Artists, and this is a project that I did um, with a team of my colleagues in the U.S. for the American Association of Museums Conference. And the other thing is actually a summary of the points I'm going to make, so you don't even have to write them down, with a little spot in the back for you to make your own manifesto. So we'll pass these out. So, why are we here today? We are here today because we are moving from an old world order to a new world order. And in the old world, the museum was a place that was sealed. In the new world, our world has become much more porous, and the museum as well. We are here because in the old world, the museum was a place that was fixed, and knowledge felt like it was fixed. In the new world order, the museum is a much more organic entity. We are much more organic entities, and knowledge is much more organic. We are here because in the new world order, the museum experience looked like something on the left. That was made by an artist. In the new world, we have a museum experience on the right that looks like this. Now, these, this is a project. These actually are artists on the right. These are artists from Los Angeles, a collective named Machine Project, and they're standing there getting ready to enact their work of art, which is going to be a concert that's done on the field, on a field adjacent to the walker, with push mowers, with bells attached to them. Now, both of these are works of art. We are here today because technology has never made it so easy to connect and share and be public. And yet, the more digital we become, the more we need physical contact. We are here today because the more politically polarized we become. And on the left, we have um, uh, seen from our, an image of Occupy Wall Street, and on the right, we actually have an image from a Tea Party rally. Um, these could not be more polar, politically polarized um, viewpoints in the United States. And the more that our world becomes like this, and it's particularly poignant and virulent in the U.S., the more we need to find common ground. And we are here today because I believe in these transformations we actually can become, as educators and artists, we can become re-energized and actually find new purpose. Or, as Oliver said earlier today, we can find a way, we can, how do we take a stand in the world? Now I'm going to actually fast track through my slides. I was going to do a little backpedaling and tell you where I came from for the last 20 years, and I'm actually not going to do that now. I'm actually going to talk about a project, Open Field, which in a way has been a very defining project in the arc of my 20-year career as a museum educator and as a walker. And it has really been a way in which, um, through these ideas that we've talked about today, about participation, I have, my staff has, the community of Minneapolis has, and I believe the Walker Art Center has really taken a stand in the world. So I'm going to go through. You can see I, I do come from a real museum. It once looked like that. <laughs> now it looks like that. It once had an art school. It still has an art school, although what the students make looks very different. Um, this was a social practice class that we did 
that's a, actually an art student giving gondola rides in the pond next to the Spoon Bridge and Sherry. Um, our security staff is not amused. Um, <laughs> this is my doppelganger. We call her Sad Girl. <laughs> but I show this only to say that in, in, in all of this, some things never change. Children make messes. Children continue to make messes. Um, and th this is a, again, these are some of the projects that I've worked on. I was instrumental in starting a teen program at the Walker. Um, it's a group of 12 teens who actually organize projects for their peers at the Walker Art Center. They, they act actually as a kind of audience in residence at the Walker, and the project's been going on for about 15 years. Um, I was really instrumental in developing an artist residency program at the Walker over the years. Um, that the Walker, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a multidisciplinary institution. It has a performing arts, a very active performing arts program, and a film program, as well as a visual arts and design program and education program. Um, I also uh, was part of a team that actually went digital with the collection and created a project called Arts Connected, which provides um, uh, the access to teachers for the, to the full collection of the of the Walker's holdings, and then lastly, one of the things I've also done a lot of, and you'll you you may be able to pull some of this out, is I've really mined the institution's own history um, as a way as a vehicle to think about how to renew programs and um, and this is a project that was actually done in 1940. It was called the Inquisition, and. Um, Real briefly, the Walker, the Walker actually has a very interesting history that I won't go in, into in depth, but it actually was a WPA institution. It was actually founded by, um, it was founded as a partnership between T.B. Walker, who actually owned, it was a, a private, um, had a private gallery and a collection, a group of community activists in the Twin Cities who wanted to start um, an art center, and the federal government um, in, the, in the, at the end of the 1930s during the Depression. Um, and so it actually has very deep progressive DNA to it. Um, and this, uh, in this image, Daniel Deffenbacher started a, uh, a program called the Inquisition in which experts battled it against lay people for what some, and, and, and being able to identify and to talk about works of art. And you can see um, the audience is ahead here. And last year, we actually resurrected the project um, in, in a very, very, very different way, where we pitted experts again against the audience. And once again, the experts did not fare very well. <laughs> but really, what I'm here today is to talk about this project, Open Field. And Open Field has been a three-year experiment that really um, has invited the public and artists to create a cultural commons on the Walker's green space. And it's been very inspired by the belief that creative communities are collective endeavors that thrive in a landscape of diverse ideas and practices. So in other words, we all do better when we all do better, and the sum of us is smarter than the one of us. The project began with a very simple question. We had a four, so much like today, when you had some yarn, 10 people, and a gallery, what would you do? We began with a four acre lawn that's adjacent to the Walker Art Center and a question, what would you do with an open field? This was very much an extension of our earlier social experiments and research, and in here you can see we've done things like offer yoga, yoga classes with artists in the galleries. Um, on the right, we, we've produced sort of innovative exhibitions where people can come and perform and participate, workshops outside the museum, and then programs, team programs, and other kinds of programs that actually took artists and audiences out into the street. As part of the research we'd also done that informed this was something called, um, we did a civic engagement map where we actually worked with, we interviewed 35 different leaders and stakeholders in Minneapolis to ask them what a town square looked like and how the walker might actually function as a town square and a place of convergence. And from this we actually took the, um, took the research and created um, a kind of visual 
visual map or um, a visualization of the research, which included a model called the 4C model of engagement. And this really attempted to propose a socially conscious approach to cultural programming, largely for the staff and the other curators of the Walker. And it also included something called the spectrum of civic engagement, which really started to ask, what does it mean to be civically engaged? How, what does it look like? How do you recognize it? And you'll see it's everything from, on one end, it's this idea of commentary. In other words, to be able to comment on something, to take a stand on something, means that you, you thought you, you understand what it is that you value. And the first step in any process is to be able to articulate what you, va what you value. And so that that became a very important aspect of our work, getting people to articulate values, and then sort of taking them through a series where we might have dialogue about our shared or differing values, we might enact change or try to make change, all the way to leadership, where some people were inspired to go off and make change in the world separate from the institution. In theory, because um, it's always good to have a theory, in theory, open field was really part of a set of larger conversations that we were having in the institution about changing institutional practice. So we were looking at things like commons theory, we were looking at the evolution of socially engaged art practice, and we were looking at all of the endless literature that's going on about participatory culture. And really, in practice, it's actually something quite simple. It's about finding a space where the public, the institution, and artists can actually come together, share resources, and make something together. Its goals were, um, its goals were ambitious. And um, we set out to really, in part, we wanted to resist old ways of thinking. We wanted to resist the idea that the museum is the primary author of content and experience that we were not, we wanted to start out with the idea that we were not the experts and it was not all about us. We wanted to create a platform for many types of creative activity generated by artists and non-artists. So we're really interested in figuring out how to engage DIY communities, amateur makers, um, and, a, and a range of other kinds of creative activities. We really wanted to position creativity as something that was collective and civic and that something that really operated outside of the marketplace. And we wanted to imagine a new kind of public gathering space for the city. This was, a, this was essentially a, an, an empty four-acre lawn. Public space is very much at a premium um, in the United States. A lot of it is what we call private public space. It's privately held, um, but publicly shared, as is, as is open field. Um, we don't have the same... Um, the same robust embrace of public space, I think, that you do in Europe and, and you do in Denmark. And really, we saw it as a way to blend social, intellectual, and creative experiments and encounters. So quite quickly, what we did is we realized that we couldn't. this was something that we couldn't do alone, that if we were trying to create a shared space, then we should invite people in to build the space with us. So we convened a group of 30 architects, artists, and designers to propose for a day to propose new ideas for the field. They looked at our site, and this is actually what it looked like when we started, and they began to identify what would make a good social space, and largely, as we like to say, they really identified what made our ugly baby so ugly. And um, as you can see, there's really not a lot out there. Um, this is, in fact, there's a, that's a fire lane. There were no amenities. Um, it's very, very exposed to the, to the elements. As well, they also plotted potential interactions between artists and the public. And as an aside, the day that we went to have the charrette, we, I was ready, my team was ready to launch a project called The Public Classroom. And we were going to do a call for people to submit ideas to teach, to do skill shares and teach classes, and then we were going to choose them, and then we were going to create a big calendar that was um, going to offer all of these, all of these different ideas and projects that had been generated by the community. And one of the artists in the charrette said, "That is exactly the wrong thing to do. All you're doing is reinscribing the institution as the curatorial voice of authority. We think you should let people do whatever they want." This was the day before I was about to push on on the computer. <laughs> we scuttled the whole project and started all over again. Because I realized he was right. All we were doing was reinscribing our own behavior. We couldn't even see that. 
As well, they also suggested tools and amenities to make the field more inviting. And in spring 2012, we actually dug up ground and we built the space adjacent to the museum. And it, we added food, shade, seating, and a very large open field. And that's, that's basically what we started with. We added something called the Tool Shed and Drawing Club to provide ongoing platforms for public engagement because we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And we knew we needed to always guarantee that something would be happening. And so the Tool Shed um, was full of all kinds of things that for creativity, for social engagement, for recreation. Um, I think Minneapolis, probably a lot like Denmark, loves its summer because summer is very short and very precious to us. Um, as a matter of fact, it snowed last week um, in Minneapolis. So, so it's very important that we're outside and together. And Drawing Club, which was actually um, has become a, a very, very important part of the project, is just a weekly, it's a weekly project where people gather and draw collectively. The first rule of Drawing Club is what's made in Drawing Club stays in Drawing Club. So everything is done collectively, and when somebody decides something's done, they take the drawing out, and they put it aside in the pool. And we do this where we invite also local artists and visiting artists to come sit and join people drawing. The most important part of the project is that the public is invited to share their own creative activities with very, very, very minimal mediation. Um, and I won't go into the rules, but the minimal mediation is that basically no one gets hurt. <laughs> And we also provided an online hub, so there's a public calendar, we help document things, and we provide <coughs> guidelines for the field. And the guidelines, are, as, we, as we call them after the first year, the first year they were the rules of the commons, and then a very smart young person in my office suggested perhaps we should call them field etiquette um, as a way to be more inviting. So as you can see, it really is around this idea of building something and caretaking it, tending it collectively. So its basic rules are protect the spirit, protect the space, and protect the people. In hindsight, there actually probably were strategies of engagement, and they look something like you need tools for empowering people to participate on their own, you need rules for guiding participation, so people know what to do and how to behave. So because we realized, one of the things we realized is we were not just changing the rules for ourselves, we were actually changing the rules of the institution for the audience. They're not used to coming to the walker and, doing, and being able to do what they want, or throw a frisbee, or play with a hula hoop, or engage in a LARPing activity, or attend, attend a knitting class that wasn't being taught by, or was being taught by someone who had nothing, no affiliation with the museum at all. So the rules for everybody were changing, and it, this became a very, very, very important and long process of figuring out how to communicate that. Seating or modeling participation. Again, this idea that people didn't, at the beginning, people didn't know what to do. They're like, what do you mean? Should I, should I teach an art class? And we're like, no, 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 no. Don't teach an art class. Bring a book club. Um... Come play a violin. You know, do whatever you want, as, as, as I like to say, as long as it's not miming, okay? Because I am afraid of mimes. Um, and, but, but we realized people were really reluctant to do it. So what we did is we actually seeded, much in the way we did today in the galleries, where your behavior was giving other people permission to behave differently, we did that as well. And we invited people we knew who did interesting or strange things to come do it, do it on the field. And we documented, and we put it online, and we said, see what you can do? Now you should think like this. You should open up like that. And it's been really very, very, very successful. Um, and then meeting. This idea that really part of what we were trying to do was nurture casual and social encounters. And that's really what Drawing Club was. It was a place to come meet and do something, not with the goal of learning something, but just with the goal of coming and doing something fun and creative with other people. And a lot of incredible things happened around those picnic tables every week. So over the course of three years, the public brought more than 300 activities to the field. This is an iron pour that um, a group from uh, a, an artist organization up north came down and, and demonstrated an iron pour. Again, nobody got hurt. 
Um, we ha actually had a group of uh, Suzuki violin students who would come and they would practice on the field. These weren't, these weren't concerts, they would just practice. It was quite beautiful. Some people actually came and, and tried and stimulated um, group discussions, and this was something called the Public Intellectual, and this was a group that met, that came, it was open to the public, anybody could show up, it was a group that came every week and, and talked about the history and the future of the Public Intellectual. And as you can see, really what this is, is just a set of picnic tables. There are about five picnic tables, each hold about 10 or 12 people that are there. Um, and that and the field, and again, the, the new amenities, the ability to have a beer and a, and a burger really constitute open field. Um, we had a group of guerrilla yogis come. I think one of the things that's very interesting about the project is, I mean, we talked about this, I think, a little bit earlier, but this idea of not only what you do, but how, how you're seen. And I think one of the things the field um, the, one of the things that's remarkable about the field is that you can both have a small conversation, you can have 10 people around the picnic table, it feels really great, but then you've got this big field that's really available for kind of mass spectacle if you wanted to create it, and people really did. We did plein air painting, which for a place like the Walker was actually a very radical act, as you can imagine. The Walker Art Center is a contemporary art center. There's no plein air painting at the Walker Art Center. Um, and yet we would have these painters come, some of whom said, I never thought there would be a place for me. Like, I never thought I could come to the Walker and actually, like, paint a picture of the skyline or paint a landscape. And yet people did this, and it's really, again, quite remarkable and really opening ourselves up to a whole group of creative people who never imagined themselves um, having a place for themselves at the Walker. And so, in addition to inviting the public in, it became very important that we also saw it as a place for artists to experiment. So each summer we work with, we have two residency projects. They're largely artists from outside of Minneapolis, and they're invited, they're artists who are very interested in working in the public sphere, and we invite them actually to think of and create a project on the field, both in terms of their own practice, but really thinking about how to create a platform um, for the public. A very important feature of this is that the artists are not more privileged in what they can do than the public is privileged in what they can do. And the artist projects don't have priority over space than the public projects. Everybody has to get along. And that is one of the preconditions um, in working with the artists on the field. And we've had some days where it's been really messed up and confusing about what's going on. Um, so here again, we have machine project. And we have a collective called Red 76, and they built a schoolhouse um, working with the public to imagine a new school on the field. They did a pop-up book academy. We had a group called Future Farmers from San Francisco. They did a, a wonderful project called The People Without a Voice Cannot Be Heard, which really looked at um, how the voice in all its manifestations, from the human voice to the media, um, to singing, all helps constitute community and a commons. And then they did, this is a project that they did at the end. And then Machine Project, this collective from Los Angeles did 17 projects in two weeks, um, including the finale, which was called the Concert for the American Lawn. And this was, um, we, so, <laughs> We worked, with, we worked with actually a, a, a quite talented uh, musician, Chris Kalmeyer, who created a piece specifically for Open Field. It was a concert in three parts. The beginning um, was, a, I don't have a picture of it, and I wish I did for you. The first part was a sheep chewing grass being mic'd with a boom mic being held over it. So the sound of the sheep chewing grass was part one. And I can tell you, sheep will not eat grass alone they have to be in pairs. And if there's only one of them, I did not know this. They bleat, and they're miserable, and they won't eat. Um, I've learned a lot through this project. Part two was our grounds crew on rider mowers with an amplifier on the back, riding in a prescribed, choreographed way around the field. We did not mow the field for two weeks prior to this performance because mowing it was such a critical part, and we needed to have grass. And so they rode this amplified, these amplified lawnmowers. And then the last part was the concert where people were invited to bring their real mowers, their push mowers, 
and we attached bells to each push mower, and we broke into three groups, and each group had a set, we had a set of instructions, and we each went off into various parts of the field with our push mowers in this particular way for 26 minutes while people watched us. And then we pushed ourselves off the lawn into various directions until the sound of our, our push mowers and our bells faded into the distance in the neighborhood. And we actually had a woman come up to us at the end and say, I can't believe that I can tell my friends that I performed at the Walker Arts Center. <laughs> they also did something called um, Tragedy of the Sea Nymph. This was an opera for dogs, starring dogs. And um, this was, you can see the opera, it's a film that was made um, of this opera. It started Chihuahua and a French um, bulldog. And it had a live human accompaniment. So there, was an op there were opera singers and a string quartet. Um, and um, if you came with a dog, you got preferred seating. Because the opera was really not intended for humans, it really was intended for dogs. So we had about 600 people and about 100 dogs. Um, another project we did, we built an outdoor pizza oven um, one day with a sculptor who actually gave a lecture on Carl Andre while building the pizza oven, and then we ate pizza. We worked with another design group where we actually built mobile kitchens for collectivist action, and this was um, a project, one of the projects where um, we, were, we were making food as part of it. But there was, these were a whole series of mobile projects that now live on around Minneapolis. And you can see, actually, they're taking one of the projects. It's a solar oven. And this is a local chef who used the solar oven to do a project, actually just last week, called Community Soup at a farmer's market, where he invited everybody to get something from the farmer's market and contribute it, and he made soup, and then shared the soup with everybody. And then we did another project with a local group called Rolu. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about this, but they actually did. I, they're a group of very talented um, landscape architects and designers, and I invited them because they had done this really wonderful project um, where they built a set of rocking chairs um, with some mothers from uh, from North Minneapolis. And, and I thought, well, this is going to be great. They're going to build a studio out of the, on the field, and they actually did an amazing project. But without a doubt, it was the most conceptually complicated project we did in all in all of the time we did it. I I didn't realize that that um, making things was was going to be so uh, conceptually challenging. So really, one of the things that we've learned is really about the power of the platform. And I think when you have a really robust platform, small things can become big. Small things can stay small, and it works. Small things can can become big. So, at the very end of Open Field, what happened recently, I think, really encapsulates the success of this project. In May, a young staffer on my team said, can I, have an, can I throw an internet cat video festival? And I said, okay. And I don't know, do you watch, do people, how many people here watch cat videos on the internet? Ha! Huh, I knew it. What's your favorite one? Uh, I think it's uh, a cat uh, running into a wall. Oh, you like the cat? Oh, you like the cats that have accidents, right? Has anyone seen Keyboard Cat? The cat that goes like this and plays the keyboard, yeah. right? Has anyone seen Henri, the existential cat? <laughs> you haven't? Oh, all right. Well, I, we're going to start a whole new trend here in Denmark today. So. People apparently like to watch cat videos. So we thought this was actually going to be a bit of a lark. We're going to do this the last weekend. We thought we'd set up a projector. We'd show it. A hundred people would show up. Everyone could submit their favorite cat videos because we know that you like to watch them, even if you don't admit it. Well, what happened is we put this call out, okay, for the Internet Cat Video Festival. We were going to be very excited with a hundred entries. This thing went viral on the internet, okay? The, the day after we posted it, we got calls from the BBC, we got calls from Shanghai, we got calls from Brazil, we got calls from Time Magazine, we got calls from the LA Times, we got calls from the New York Times, Fox News came, CNN News came. Everybody wanted to talk about the first ever internet cat video festival. 
we had a group of we had a group of journalists who asked if they could have backstage passes to the festival when they came. And we said to them, you understand that this is a field and there's going to be a little screen. Well, what happened is we started watching the internet and there's a huge amount of seismic activity. We had 10,000 entries to the Internet Cat Video Festival. And we realized it was no longer going to be a laptop projected <laughs> against a wall. Now, I do want to just step back and say, part of the reason of doing this project is that it was really meant to be a social experiment to see if the things that we do in private and the things that we do in the internet actually might translate into real time and space. Would we come together to watch something that we normally watch alone or we just share between ourselves? As it turns out, the answer is yes. So this is a not great photo, but this is, as you can see down in the front, there's a little screen down there where there are 50 minutes of curated internet cat videos <laughs> and 10,000 people. <laughs> freeway was stopped, the traffic was stopped on the freeway. People called to complain the next day that they couldn't get there because they couldn't find a place to park less than a mile and a half away. <laughs> and the world paid attention. We got the cover of the Saturday, of Saturday's New York Times. Um, so, and I, I will say this, it is the most bizarre and fabulous thing that I've ever experienced in my life. Um, I really can't tell you, and I, as a juror, I watched a lot of cat videos. Um, I actually am now an expert in cat videos, and it was a very exciting evening. We also had awards, and um, so we gave awards away, and we had categories, and, and they were like for best drama, best comedy, <laughs> best foreign film, best art film. The art ones were boring. We actually had artists try to submit cat videos to the film festival. But one of the criteria is they had to be on YouTube. So it had to be something that was already on the internet and it was already sharing for free. Um, and we actually had two, the, the maker of Henri and the maker of, oh God, I can't remember the other cat's name, actually came and showed up. Um, we were there and were signing autographs and, and posing with fans. <laughs> So what have we learned? Well, one thing we've learned is that people like cats. But I think, so some of the things I'm going to do now, now I'm just going to go sort of through a litany and maybe sort of end this conversation so a way we can talk about what we've learned today. So some of the things I've learned about this, through this project and about participation over the years, to quote one of the artists, we will learn from these things in ways that no one could have taught us. And I think, Albert, this is really to your point of we learn by making. Um, and we learn, we've learned about the power and the importance of utopic imagination, or as Taya said, how can we dream together? We have learned to stop asking why and start asking, why not? <laughs> These two guys just showed up one day and somebody <laughs> ran out and took a picture of them. Um, I can't tell you why. But I will say, why not? We have learned, oh, we have learned, oh, okay, missing a slide there. We have learned that context can transform any content. We have learned that there are no bounds to creative practice. We have learned that good participation is not a measurement but rather good participation is a sentiment. So what do we mean by good participation? And I would say that each one of these um, phrases that I'm about to put up are probably worth a day of conversation and exploration, but I'm just going to throw them out as the beginning of a conversation we can keep having together or ones that we have with ourselves and our colleagues going forward. Good participation sometimes looks like failure. 
Risk is involved, and we should really think about what risk means and what it looks like. But I would say, much like the exercise that we did this morning, I would ask you, did you learn more from what worked in your morning, or did you learn more from what didn't work? Good participation provides a platform in which people can really bring their best creative selves forward and their best selves forward. Good participation investigates the unknown, and its outcome is unknown. It is risky, because you don't know what's going to happen. And I think a lot of times we're used to wanting to, we want to know what's going to happen at the end. Good participation transforms even the most traditional places. And this is a project that, that Rolu did where they, they worked with a designer to create these garments that people wore so that they themselves acted like works of art um, in the spaces of the museum. This is based on Helio Odesica's Paranglais works. Good participation embraces our most cherished values and ethics. Those are sincerity for us. We identify those as sincerity, authenticity, generosity, and I would also add a kind of witnessing or noticing of the other person, and I think this is actually very important. We ask visitors to engage with us in our work, in our institution, but I think in order to, add, to add, make that invitation, we should witness them and ask them, notice them as well, because I think that's part of any relationship is, I'll be interested in you if you're interested in me. I also think um, another important value is really that of presence. Not only to be in the present moment, and my, I'm making funny noises and I've done it the whole time. I'm sorry. Do, do, you, want, do you have a hand mic? It doesn't matter. I'm on the side. I've never experienced this before. Okay. <laughs> you know why? Because, because in participatory experiences, you don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> and we just, in, we just enacted that. Here, maybe if I take this off. Is that it? Now that I'm almost done? Okay. So good participation, that's okay. I mean, it, it's still, it's still okay. there. Okay. I give you the mic if you want. Yeah, I can. I'm almost done. Good participation is not temporary. And I do think a commitment to an audience um, and to a way of working is actually really important. These are the teens from our Teen Arts Council, and this is actually a story we did um, about their successes um, about 10 years after they uh, finished the program. And this, this in and of itself could be another conversation, but we're involved in a long-term longitudinal study about what happens, um, the impact of, of these kinds of museum programs on teens, and without a doubt, they transform people's lives. Good participation does not back away from complexity. Good participation builds relationships, and of course, this is something we should talk at length a great deal about, about the importance of relationships, what constitutes good relationships, um, and why it is such an important value to our work. Good participation is about pleasure, um, and this is, I think, is something that is, um, in, in my experience working in the contemporary art world, pleasure is something we don't often talk about. We talk a lot about um, intellectual stimulation. We talk about we talk about a lot of things, but we don't really talk about pleasure and happiness. We're afraid of that. It makes us seem less serious. And I actually think it's it's a conversation that if if we don't embrace, I don't know why we work. I think good participation allows for play. Good participation dismantles hierarchy. And with this, I think, again, there are a lot of things we could say about this, but I will say two things very quickly is, I think in the hierarchy, part of it is what we ourselves have to be vulnerable and realize that we're going to put ourselves in a position where we may publicly fail or we may publicly not have the answer. And as well, I'm also going to pause it that I think, so I think in a way you have to be vulnerable and in another way you also have to be fierce because I do think that institutions... Um, are reluctant. There are a lot of people in institutions who don't want to see their own power and their own hierarchies broken down. And I think as educators and as leaders of this work within our institutions, we need to be fierce and constant in really pushing against that. And in the end, I would say that participation really asks everything of us that art asks. And in doing so, <laughs> It sets the art free. And along with that, we ourselves 
or set free. So I guess I'm going to close by just saying, um, by inviting you all to really think about what is your manifesto for good participation. And really, for open field, we learned all of these things, but our manifesto was very simple. But I like to believe that it was not simple-minded. And that is quite simply open field is what we make together. So thanks. <laughs>